arms of the three major. Yeah, thank you. That's fine. So, like I was saying, the Yali Network Nigeria is one of the three arms of the Yali groups that is established by the U.S. Um, government. And uh, we have the MWF, which is the Mandela Washington Fellow Alumni, the regional level, the regional fellowship one, which is the Yali RLC, and the Yali Network, which is um, more of the implementing phase where we have 35 representatives in um or 35 hubs in in the state in nigeria with the fct that means we have 36 hubs in total in nigeria and we have presence in all african countries the essence of yali network is to continue to build young african leaders to continue to invest in them and one of the opportunity of that the yali network provides its members and by extension to as many that are not yet member of the network is to um, give you opportunities to show, show you guidelines and things to do to continue to position you properly for global opportunities. So this um, segment or this training is one of those activities that we embark on. And it's a three-day power pack training session focusing on the three tracks of the YALI itself, which is a business track, the civic, um, and also the public engagement. So you're going to be having the business today. And I'm sure we have our moderator on standby waiting to um, take over. But on those notes, I, I, I want to welcome, I also want to say that Enough, she's here. I was going to say that on behalf of our, of our national lead, um, we are, we are welcoming you. But well, if I okay, yeah, I if you can unmute just, just to show welcome. Thank you for joining by today. A pleasure for you to mute. Yeah, kindly mute your mic. Thank you. Um, is it a suitable time or is it okay for you to unmute and just say a few things before we delve into today's session properly? Good evening. Good evening, um, Maria. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this um, um, uh, training, in a sense, the guide session. And we hope that it's going to be profitable to you. Our facilitators are already in the building. Our moderator is already here as well. And we trust that you'll be able to glean as much as you can from today's event. And if you have any questions, particularly for those of you who would be going, um, choosing the business track, please start writing them now so that by the time it's their time for you to ask questions, you'll be able to get your answers. So thank you all so much for joining. And I think without much ado, we can get started. Thank you. Thank you for me. And over to you, our moderator for the day. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. And I'm also a fellow of the 2023. And today I'll be moderating this session uh, with our co-fellows. And by the end of this session, aspect of the fellowship, uh, and you'll understand your track uh, very well because you have people that are capable of explaining. Thank you so much. Um, So um, I, I would love to uh, all, uh, introduce our um, fellows, which include uh, Gabriel Ibodo, and uh, he's the 2023 Manila Fellow uh, for the business track. And uh, we will hear his experience as well with uh, Kilola David, uh, our lady, and uh, Frida. Uh, had that going all often. Uh, uh, having excuse, so we'll excuse her for today. And then I'll look to proceed. Uh, Gabriel, if you can hear me, 
uh, I would love you to introduce yourself and the uh, business uh, that you are doing, and also the, the university you've been to uh, doing your fellowship. Um, all right, thanks so much, um, um, Mohamed. Um, so good evening, everyone. Just to confirm, please, can you hear me very well? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. Yeah. So my name is Gabriel Oyebodo Um, I'm a tech consultant and entrepreneur. I'm based in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, basically, what I do is to help SME businesses build um, platforms and solutions in tech and try as much as possible to help them actualize the potentials in the market. Um, I've been in tech field for over um, 10 years right now. And um, basically, that's, that's more like my dream. Um, basically, one of my dreams is just to create an innovation hub based in Lagos that help teenagers to build up their creative mind. Currently, now we are working with different partnerships with schools right now. So those are the things we are trying to accomplish now. Uh, the institute I was posted to, I was posted to Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, Bethlehem, um, and it was an interesting one. Funny enough, I was the only Nigerian posted there, so it was really, really an interesting one, basically. Thanks for having me once again. Thank you so much, Gabriel. <laughs> it was uh, a lot of experience, I know. Uh, even though it's been uh, the only Nigerian here, I had uh, some of the fellows that you present Nigeria well. So thank you so much. Um, I would love like to move to Philola David, and uh, if you can help us uh, introduce yourself and also the institute you've been posted during your presentation. Hello, Muhammad. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, bro. Awesome. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ifelola Olaleye, and um, I am a social entrepreneur, um, the CEO of MedicBird. Uh, MedicBird is currently um, a laboratory, lab technology company, and um, we also own QMind, which is a mental health um, technology startup with a mandate to connect people to affordable mental health care, right? Yes, yeah, so um, our company was founded in June um, 29th, 2019, and um, that made us uh, very positioned for um, the COVID-19 pandemic, which um, happened um, towards the end of 2019 to into 2020, and that was really what powered my application um, into Yali, and um, the success and the um, uh, heights that we were able to achieve during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, was what actually um, led us to Yali, Innovo, and a lot of other awards, right? I I had my um, fellowship at the University of Texas, Austin, Texas. Um, within the school, uh, we functioned at the Macombs Business School, and um, I was one of two Nigerians, one of two Nigerians um, that was posted to UTA. Yeah, so thank you very much. It's nice to be here with you guys. Thank you so much, Felala. I was also posted at the UT. I'm a fellow for 2023, and we're also two Nigerians. Uh, I don't know if you know Prof. Target. He talks a lot oh, about you. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I know him very well. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. It's nice yeah, to meet you. That's yeah. Nice to nice meet you, bro. Yeah. Uh, head, heading to uh, Freda and Yenro. Uh, if you can hear us, please, uh, will you tell us your name, what you do, and which institute you Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Frida Anyong, and I am the founder of EBH Africa. EBH Africa is a digital innovation hub that um, focuses on empowering small businesses across Africa um, through education, community, access to finance and support services. Um, we've been on since 2020, February 18th, um, just before the heat of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, that also facilitated the process of the work that we were doing and the value um, that we brought to a lot of entrepreneurs globally. 
Um, I was posted to Clark Atlanta University um, in Atlanta, Georgia, where I was also in the leadership in business track um, as one of the two Nigerians uh, that was also posted to the university. I'm excited to share with everyone on the call and I look forward to an exciting and insightful conversation. That's good. That's good, Freda. Uh, uh, it's it's so interesting to, to hear from you guys, uh, achievements, and experience. Um, that's so great. But uh, here in the in our midst, we have people that uh, doesn't know a lot about the fellowship, and uh, we have people that already know little about it. Uh, so, Freda, I don't know if you can go ahead and uh, tell them what the MWF is. Okay, great. So um, hello everyone again. <laughs> um, MWF is the short form for Mandela Washington Fellowship. Every year, the American government takes 700 leaders from across Africa. Um, so you have um, leaders from Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Mauritius, Mauritania, you know, as many African countries uh, as, as much as possible, Senegal, Ethiopia, um, and they take them to the US for an exchange program. The idea for this is to create a platform where um, these African leaders can see beyond their immediate environment and their immediate network and provide them an opportunity to expand their reach. So getting um, expanded markets insights into their work. Um, also connecting with fellow Africans, because one of the things that I really enjoyed um, from the fellowship was not just the training that we're learning, um, we're getting, but the, the network I was able to make with other African um, leaders, you know, it's establishing your yourself as a, as a leader amongst your fellows, um, establishing partnerships and collaborations. I'm very sure some of us who have gone through the program already have ideas on who to partner with in another country. Um, since I got back from the fellowship, I've um, had conversations of things I've done in South Africa, Kenya, um, Ghana, and also doing much more. So it's another way to understand the culture. It's another way to learn the culture of other Africans, another way to also learn the culture of the Americans and see how best you can it can influence your work and also position you um, to come back to your community and expand the work. Because something people take like is oh I'm, uh, this is just free visa to go to america and I, I'm, I'm just going to chill this is not a vacation it's a learning journey that you go through and you experience because the return on investment for this is that you come back to your community and you can affect many more lives um so let's say for example i, I see if is on the call if and i were on the same, um, we're in the same uh, set. Uh, you're doing something on mental health, for example. If you go on this um, learning journey or this learning experience, the idea is for you to come back and create something that would also empower more people. For myself, when I started, we we just started the hub, the digital hub, and we had about maybe 400 people using our platform to grow their businesses. And as of today, we have done over 3,000 people globally. And this is just you taking the idea and the knowledge that you've gotten, the network that you've built to come back and work. It's not for you to go and play, not for you to go and chill. So yeah, that's uh, an idea of the, the fellowship. Thank you. Uh, so um, maybe uh, that was great explanation. And I think uh, even if, uh, someone is going to the fellowship with this great explanation, you'll be able to catch up and understand what the MWF is, but I don't know if um, you can highlight more on the, um, who are eligible to, to, to apply for the fellowship in terms of years and in terms of uh, the year of experience. Like, do they need to have a lot of year of experience, a lot of years in business before they apply for the fellowship or something? Okay, um, 
yeah for eligibility i'm pretty sure if you go on the website you would um, see um the criteria to know if you're eligible first of all you must be from an african country all the countries are stated in the website stated on the website so you have nigeria ghana kenya rwanda ethiopia you know you must be from Africa, you must be an African, um, also residing in Africa, you know, you have your work based here in Africa, um, you have um, a an understanding of the African markets or the African ecosystem that you're trying to impact. Um, you are of age between, I think, 25 to 35. And um, I, I don't think there's any, there's no years of experience. You just have something tangible that you're doing either you want to be able to impact or you already have um, like something that you're doing at the moment. I know some people got in um, because they were planning to do some things uh, while some others got in because they already had started. So it doesn't really matter. Even if you are still at the very early stage of starting um, your impact journey or your business and you want to apply for this it is I don't think the years of experience is what you need this is where the whole this application guide forum is very important is how you put your story how you can tell your story um, to attract someone listening to you so when I tell people about applying for the fellowship I tell them don't just write a story that is sympathetic and Everybody can say, oh, wow, such a ch touching story. Write your story as a leader because they are seeing what they are looking out for is leaders. They are looking for leaders in Africa. So if you're writing your story as a leader, it helps them to see that, okay, this is what this person is doing or what this is what this person is about to do. And this is an investment, right? So let me give everybody a brief. They are taking taxpayers' money in the, in the U.S., and they are funding Africans on this exchange program. So let's say approximately $50,000 per African. So if you are writing your story, write it like you're writing to an investor. You're writing, um, you want an investor to invest in you. You want an investor to take a chance on you. So it is very important that as you're writing, you're not just saying, this is what I want to do, but you're also letting them know that, hey, I am your best investments. I am the person you need on this program. If you if you don't invest in me, you are missing out on the impact that I'm going to be giving when I come back from this program. So yeah, basically that's that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I would love to add with uh, if uh, our, our participants, uh, uh, if you're passionate about uh, just the application skills, you have to be. Uh, a leader that's done social to his community, uh, further just experience, uh, you, you, you don't need to be uh, having a lot of years of experience. If you're applying to start something tangible to your community, you can apply. So if you are procrastinating about, I don't have a lot, I don't have much, but applying, Freda has just cleared the door for us that you can go and apply. Thank you so much, Freda. A lot of questions will come later. <laughs> Um, uh, I have I, I have few questions for you. Uh, it's regarding to the essay, um, uh, to the application uh, um, form, let's say, and the, there is a place where it, it asks people about their um, educational status, and some people are doing their degree, uh, they, they, they are not finished yet, so can they apply for the fellowship, and what advice do you have for them in terms of their uh, educational background. All right. Thank you once again, Mohammed. Um, I think this is a very, very uh, powerful question. And um, I have quite a number of experience with um, with that because while we did our fellowship, we had quite a number of people of different educational backgrounds. We had people who had taught um, um, postgraduate qualifications, masters, PhD. Well, we had people also who had not yet finished university, right? You know, just like Fred said a while ago, um, the, the, the age bracket for YALI is typically 25 to 35. But in some cases, they do consider, um, in some cases for MWF, they do consider even less than 25. They may pick 24. And um, um, with those lesser age co um, consideration, 
Um, it means that you're going to be having people who are not exactly all too academically um, uh, 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 accomplished, right? So from what I saw uh, from all the people that participated um, with us, uh, especially at the University of Texas, Austin, we had quite a number of people who actually had not yet finished school, right? And we had people that were um, um, or just had finished their bachelors, and we had people who had PhDs, right? But from what I, from the idea I get from the entire fellowship, I think it's pretty much clear that the emphasis is not really on the educational background or um, the number of degrees that you have, but on the impacts that you're generating um, in the continent, right? So yeah, I hope that answers that. Yeah, that answers that. Actually, um, I know a lot of people. I think have um, been my degree. I'm not doing with degree. I haven't even started yet. I apply, so uh, the 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 thinking of that will affect them to see chance. Uh, yeah. But you know, so I think will uh, prevent them to, to start the application process. But another question is, um, uh, while applying, you know, uh, definitely we know they might consider people with a degree or Masters, they may consider people with those, and then uh, they, they they leave place for description. Uh, so there are a lot of questions pertaining that description uh, um, box. Should they fill it or should not they fill it? Since they have already filled the options about their the program and the program of the study. So what advice would you? Give? All right. So um, as much as. Um, WF is concerned, I think it's very important that you uh, give as much information as you can um, that would help to strengthen your application, right? And um, I, I don't believe that withholding any form of information does you any good, actually, right? Um, one needs to be honest, right? One of the important things that I listed when I wanted to talk about this today was that uh, one of the very important things about MWF is that you have to learn to be very vulnerable, right? Um, you need to be uh, willing to let um, the readers understand what your limitations are, if you have any, right? Because sometimes when people want to go into applications like this, they want to build a castle of um, a castle of reputation that may or may not exist, right? But with MWF, I believe that you can be uh, you can be honest. And um, that honesty comes a long way in helping your application come across as genuine, right? So if you didn't go to school or if there is something that you feel like could, like a disability that you feel could be uh, a natural drawback, in fact, this may not actually be translated or interpreted in that way. So um, just be honest, give as much um, uh, uh, relevant information as is required of you right? If it is required of you, just give that information. If it is not required, I wouldn't advise you to give that information, right? But if it is required and it is relevant, do not withhold that um, that information. Yes. Thank you so much. I think this um, is, uh, also explained it well. Uh, what he means is if you see anything that's optional, but then uh, you think it will Boost your application and to qualify what you just feel, but the fail says optional. You can go ahead and fill it, but don't exaggerate. And if you think it should not be uh, more important, you don't say, okay, uh, let me fill it. It may like uh, complicate what you feel and the description as well. But as long as you think it will modify what you see, you can go ahead and fill it. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. 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 <laughs> Yeah, now let's go to the fresh blood. You know, uh, we call you ancestors, Fiola and uh, Freda. <laughs> so now let, let, let us go to the uh, fresh blood, Gabriel. Um, if you can hear me, uh, I, uh, we know the Mandela Washington uh, application have um, ACs where you can go and fill. So I want you uh, to even come back, all the people that have gathered here is because uh, I think 70% of them is because of that AC. So you are fresh blood and you already have a lot of things in your head. You can help them uh, with advice on how they can ease their AC. Please, you are welcome. Share it with us. Thank you.
All right. Um, thanks. Thanks, uh, Mohamed. Okay, so um, let, let me start by saying my 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 story when I was applying, right? Um, so uh, when I opened the application uh, application and I saw six SE, I was just like, I'm not going to feel this. I can't write anything. I was just like, I was blank all through, right? I was just like, no, I can't do this. And I went down and I saw a fact that the writing is actually constrained to number of words. So you have two essays and you have four other essays. The first two you're going to feel is 250 words, right? And the, the last four is 150 words. So this, 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 is my, this is going to be my advice, right? The first thing I did was I needed to copy out all the questions into a document first, right? And I read through the first time and I closed my tab, right? <laughs> that, was, that was the first thing I did. I just read through one time and I closed my tab and I went off. Right now, this, this is one of the things I've noticed over time. By the time you actually see the essay, there's this anxiety, anxiousness of like, how do I go about it? It's normal, right? It's, it's just normal. But the good thing you can do is the fact that just don't put yourself under pressure, but try as much as possible to just recalibrate yourself and rethink your process all the years. Now, one, of, one, one thing that I did after copying my questions into the document was like, I read through the, the questions. I just put it in my head. And while I was working like two days, I was trying to calibrate my brain and rethink all my experience over the years. And that was all that I did. Now, after doing that, you might probably want to list out different scenarios of your leadership that have actually brought out your capability as a person that can make impact. Because the truth of the matter is that you could have different scenarios that have actually brought out something good out of you. The reality is that you could actually have created maybe one, two, three, three things that you've actually impacted in the business world in different scenarios you've actually been, right? So one of the things I did was like, I listed, I listed out all my experience, success, wins, I just listed them out. So after doing that, I needed to now articulate my story very well and pick, okay, if I'm going to pick out of these stories, which one is going to be most inspiring that have much words to talk about? So as much as possible, don't forget the fact that it's not an interview that has to be like a face-to-face. -face. It's you trying to pitch yourself using words. And you have to gather your thoughts together. That's very key, right? If it's a different case whereby you have to pitch yourself when you're seeing someone, you could actually have a lot of gestures and everything. People will be seeing your energy and everything. But the truth of the matter is that nobody's seeing you. They're reading your story, right? So you have to be able to articulate your story very well put them into, into words very well. Now, one of the approach I use when I'm writing my stories is this. I use a star approach. So what's a star approach? Star approach basically is just a scenario or situation. And the T starts for the tax. The A starts for the action you actually took. And the R actually starts for the result. So that was the approach I used for all my essays. So for every question that I was answering, I was trying to use paint a scenario of how I actually did this scenario, that answer that question at that point in time. What are the tasks I was doing at that point in time? What are the actions I took as a person leading someone or probably having to find myself in that situation? And what are the results? And that was, that was just like what actually helped me. Now, the interesting thing is that even when I went through the approach I went through, I had to go over my essay like three, four times, right? After writing, I needed to give it to a couple of people to read through. And this, this was my goal. I never told them what the, for the essay was all about. I just told them a fact that I read through and let me have your feedback. That was what I told them. And eventually when they, they were actually giving me my feedback, they were giving me a feedback of fact, okay, this is like, okay, this is what you need to do. I don't think this is actually connecting with this and stuff like that. So I needed to rewrite again and recalibrate. So this is like one of the easiest advice I always tell people, don't be in a rush to write your story right? Don't be in a rush to write your story. Try as much as possible, number one, articulate your story. Understand that people reading it has to feel like they're actually reading you at that point in time, right? It's, it's not like you're just trying to dump some words out there. You're trying to pitch yourself using words, right? And one thing you're trying to do is that at that moment in time that you want them to be able to capture, you want them to, you want your, your essays to actually capture them out of so many applications, and still glued to them because at the end of the day, you want them to actually read through and like, oh, I could feel what this person is actually saying, right? You are trying to put in an empathy into your words as much as possible. 
So one of the things that you can also do when you're writing essays, right? I know sometimes when you want to calculate words, so I use other tools like Grammarly to just put my words together and try to refine, right? So that I won't go beyond the words capacity and stuff like that and try as much as always to just read. So the thing is, is when you finish even reading your essays, right? Read and read and read and read over and over before you actually click that submit button. Because once you click that submit button, that's all, right? So you have the room to actually read, ask for feedback from people that, okay, what do you think about this essay I'm writing? And as much as possible, be true to yourself, right? When you're writing your story, it's your story. Nobody else is going to tell it. And it's you that can actually sell the story. That's just the truth. Only you can sell yourself best that way. I can't, the truth of matter that I can't sell Muhammad. Muhammad can tell his own story better than any other person. So that would be like my one, two recommendations when you're writing essays. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Um, there is a question here that says um, we should talk about other, uh, other, other parts about essays. I think Tara is the following. We've started talking about the educational background, where um, Felola stated that you, you you can apply uh, with the educational background you have, and then you can also fill the description if you feel it's important to modify. Um, what, you, what you've studied, for example, uh, let, let me give an example of this. If, if, if uh, you study stuff at uh, secondary school, you can you can add like you are the head boy in the description. I'm the head boy. I've won award of uh, best mathematician. I've won award of uh, best. Uh, no, uh, sorry. Uh, what, what, what are the secondary school subject? Science, right? <laughs> And stuff, you can write that if you participate in uh, competitions, if you want something for your school, you can boldly say, I participated in social competition. I was going to make my school proud on that description. It actually helps your essay. And now we are, uh, sorry, uh, the description. And now we are talking about the essays. And after that, we'll be moving uh, about other questions if you are following. Uh, with Trey Richard. Thank you so much for asking the question. Uh, so, uh, Gabriel, um, I know it's it's important to focus on the essays and to write uh, the impact and the contribution you've made. Uh, we know there are a lot of people that have written best essays, right? Even while you apply for the fellowship, we know there are people that. So, what do you think might be the takeaway? Then you think it's the reason why you qualify for it? You know, something like I think it's because of this that I've been able to Okay, so I, I think for me, right, it's going to be my impact over the years. And um, I, I think one of my key stories I actually mentioned was how I was able to lead like over 40 people in a split of transition into one bad um, strategy into a new strategy and how we're able to actually get a result in that timeline, right? So I think most importantly, one of the keys that actually I feel personally, right, that actually stood me out was basically, it's gonna be my success story in terms of impact. And I, I needed to state what the constraint was when I was writing my story and how I, I, I was able to actually make use of my time and resources and energy within that time constraint and resources constraint to still bring out a result, right? And I feel like basically it's just like my resilience over the time because I needed to mention what we actually had to face as a company during COVID period and how we were able to even pull out of COVID period with more success and profit as a leader, basically. Thank you so much for this. Um, uh, going back to um, Felola. Felola. I can hear you, Mohamed. I can okay. hear you. Um, Felola, I know that uh, people, the ACR, are the like, always for the uh, reviewers because that's where they put 70% of their energy and then 30% of their energy goes on the proof and then uh, your background in terms of uh, other you know, forms. So what advice can you give these people in terms of reading these cases, especially the number one cases that speaks about your major accomplishment uh, for the past few years and uh, 
what motivates you and also your plans ahead. I think it's the it's 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 that in, in, in also the ethos they give 30% attention to that particular thing to see if you're dreaming big or not. So what advice will you uh, give our participants today? All right, Mohamed, I could, I'll, I'll show you if you could recap that a little. Mm -hmm. Okay, I said um, the number one thesis that speaks about your major accomplishments. Uh, if you look into it, uh, even in our background, you will see the MWF and the, uh, and the US consulates are capturing that as our mission statement and our vision statement. So I know they, they give it like 30% attention among the ACEs and the whole ACEs, they give it 70% attention. So I, I don't know if you can help our participants today to understand that question very well so that they can write a very, very comprehensive and accomplished uh, uh, statement. All right. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, you can hear me. All right, that's good. Okay, so I, I believe that uh, with the application, uh, one of the very important things, um, especially um, your writing, is that you have to be very genuine, right? And I, I have spoken about that in the past. So uh, in the past, you you have a situation whereby, you know, people do things and um, uh, they they... From, even from the writing itself, it's already pretty much clear that there is no need to go for proof, right? There is a lot of um, um, positioning, trying to position as some sort of guru, right? And then you see a lot of successes in, the, in that person's application. You don't see any form of failure. So already from that alone, it is very much clear that the, um, the article itself is, uh, is made up, right? Another thing that I think is very important for people is to avoid a situation where um, you're, you're contracting out the writing of your essays. Now, a lot of people try to be, um, they try to, they have ideas, right, of what they should be applying for. And they actually have done some work. But they would just rather say, okay, you know what, I'm going to give this application to someone else to actually write for me. And then by the time they write it, and they don't realize that the second stage of the MWF um, um, program is an interview, they get to the interview, and what they are saying does not actually connect with what um, is, uh, is on the paper. And it's clear at that point in time that that person didn't write that particular uh, 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 article or essays. Then another very important thing that I wanted people to note um, when writing this application is in itself, you know, Gabriel already, already did a very wonderful work explaining the STAR technique. Now, the STAR technique is the very same strategy that I know a lot of people in the fellowship actually used um, in writing their application because it presents your thoughts from beginning to finish, right? You don't miss out anything in between. So you can actually, if you're just writing from your mind, you could talk about situation, task, and mix the action, right? And then jump onto the result. With the reader, that creates a sort of disconnection. And that is almost unforgivable, right? So I think um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll really, really reinforce that idea of using the STAR approach and technique towards your application. Another important thing that you should um, you should do is that you need to use concise words. You need to realize that you have a limitation of 150 words. And so you want to ensure that every single word that you are using has a place in your essay. You don't want to overstress words. You want to be concise enough. So a good example, um, I, I checked uh, um, some examples on Grammarly before I came here. You want to say brunch was very good, right? That brunch was very good is four words. But if you want to follow the rule of being concise, you can say brunch was superb. That's three words. You've saved yourself one word, right? So you have to do that negotiation or else what you're going to find out is by the time you get 150 words, you have a lot of things that you want to talk about 
but you no longer have the space or the bandwidth to actually address it. Another thing that I wanted to express as part of the writing of the article or the essays is that you need to be very authoritative, right? Um, in the writing section, you get the feeling, I've had the opportunity to review maybe one or two um, essays for MWF, and then you get some uh, ideas that people sometimes tend to be beggarly, right? They are writing the essay in a very beggarly approach, um, trying to get the readers to be sympathetic with them. And this is something that Freda actually mentioned a while ago. They are not going to be sympathetic with you. They are not going to say, oh, you know, oh, this person has really struggled a lot. We need to help this person, you know, get this fellowship. They won't do that, right? They will only be sympathetic to the stories that you tell. You know, they will go on the journey with the stories that you tell. So you need to tell your story in such a way that you are moving the readers to be sympathetic to your story, not yourself. And that is the point where your application can actually climb into, um, into, into the place where you actually want it to be, right? So you want to be very authoritative. When you're talking also, you need to be, you need to be clear. I hereby do this. I hereby did that. You don't want to start looking begali and just going around, um, around and not actually eating the point that you ought to be uh, eating. Then another very important thing when you're writing the application is you need to eliminate redundancies, right? Cutting redundant words like you know tautologies, it can help your, uh, it can help create stronger and more direct sentences, right? So this is also a variation of being concise. A good example, someone will say. The cost adds several necessary requirements. You can just say the cost adds several requirements. So you want to make sure that you have an application that um, is well written and is well uh, uh, well projected. Then the last thing that I wanted to talk about is the important part of the diction. This cannot be overemphasized. You cannot overemphasize the importance of your diction when you are writing your essay. You need the commas to be in the right place. And you need the full stops to be in the in the in the right place, because let me explain to you. Um, for every section of every year of the MWF, you have close to let's say ten thousand people applying, and they are only going to pick maybe fifty people. During our own set, um, you have to be in the top zero point six percent of the application for you to actually get rewarded with the MWF. Just so to give you a picture of what that is, it is much more easier to get uh, admitted into Harvard than to actually get the MWF fellowship. Now, this is not a um, um, this is not to scare anyone. Um, it is a perfectly doable application. You can achieve it, right? Irrespective of your um, of the stage you are in your business, you don't have to be at the uh, at the, the highest peak of your business because we can tell you from experience that we saw a lot of people who actually did MWF but were really just starting up their businesses. They were really just starting up their ventures. Um, a lady made a comment in the section recently, Oluwa Fumbi, she said she knew somebody who talked about a future project. So the most important thing is that you must be able to tell stories, tell your stories in a start with start technique, ensure that you are concise, Avoid redundancies. Make sure that your dictions are perfect, and um, ensure that you're truthful. So I think that's just the major points that I would um, I, I would like to talk about as far the writing the essays in itself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ifenola. Uh, yeah, this is wonderful. I've summarized what you uh, and Gabriel said. Uh, let's hear from Freda. Freda, I don't know if you can chip in on the issue of our case so that uh, the participant will have more highlights. All right, so I just wanted to um, say some things in addition to what Gabriel and Ife have mentioned because they have made like really solid points. Um, there's something that I also did when I was writing my applications. Uh, my application, sorry, I applied once <laughs> and it was my first time and I got in. So uh, that's also something that I usually am proud of myself for. But there's something that I did. You cannot just come out and give a story without a background. Um, one of the things Gabriel mentioned is, thank you. One of the things Gabriel mentioned was you need to create a scenario. 
Um, but you cannot create a scenario without telling someone why that scenario exists. So what I did was my business is impacting the is creating a platform where other businesses can grow and become sustainable. So I gave a background. I told the research, did a little research, and I said, statistics show that businesses um, fail within the first five years. So I'm giving a, a strong basis to why I am creating a scenario. I am giving a, a strong basis. So this positions you because you are a leader. And just like Ife mentioned, you're not coming here to write a story that everybody will now feel and say, oh my God, he started from the bottom, now he's here. Um, he had no food to eat, now he can eat. Um, nobody's going to pity you and give you money. Everybody wants to see what have you done? How are you positioning yourself? Who are you doing it for? Why are you doing it? So if you notice, the essays are all interconnected. All the questions are interconnected. There is no question that that is not your second question essay is connected to your first essay. Because if you put something and say that's your motivation, and then you put something else again and say um, uh, it, and it doesn't fall in line with your track of study, you are just writing too many things that has no basis. So what you should do is show that you are a leader, show that you understand where you are working, show that you understand the market that you are ready to serve. Especially you are writing on business, you are a business person, you have to show that you do market research. So if you're a business person and you do, um, you're a food business owner, you need to talk about why you're going into that business. But you need to say, market research, food, you know, there's a wastage of food if you're doing something in, in, in line with waste, management and you can put something that shows um why nigeria or africa or the community you are in um has that problem so when i started i mentioned something that you're writing to an investor and you are asking that investor to take a chance on you and take a chance on your business that's exactly what the fellowship is about so if you're writing as a business person and you're in the leadership in business track and you want to get into the fellowship you need to think like a business leader and I look at the first essay as telling your investor your traction and your projection. So, you know, when you're doing your business and you're telling the investor, this is how many people we have been able to um, um, get in our journey. These are many customers we've been able to get. That's what your accomplishment does for you. When you're talking about your accomplishment, you're telling your the person who is reading it, that this is the traction I have gained in the last one year. I started the business in this with no capital, but I was able to sustain it and bootstrap to be able to reach this, 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 and we generated a revenue, increasing our sales to date. Put percentage, put numbers, put values to what you are, you are doing. If you're writing your business essay, write like a business leader. Don't just come out and say, you know what, um, when, I'm, when I did this, this is what I did. I worked in this place. I did this. How did you contribute in terms of value, in terms of figures, in terms of numbers? That's what they want to see. That's how they want you to position yourself. So when you're talking about business, because I, I believe that today is a business class and that's why all of us on the session tonight are all from the business track. You're talking about business. Your long-term goals should be this, if you're itemizing your long-term goals, don't just say, I want to become a business influencer. I want to become a business leader. I want to grow my skills. I want to expand my network, blah, blah, blah. Justify why those long-term goals are important to your future accomplishments. Justify why those long-term, why those goals. So if you say, this is my goal, this is my goal because um, we want to be able to impact or generate revenue up to $1 million by 2027. Um, this is my goal because we want to reach a customer base across Nigeria and, you know, three countries in Africa by 2025. You are, you are putting a projection to your long-term goals. You're not just saying these are my goals because just the way if I said 10,000 people are applying for this thing, the way you are applying for it, 10,000 other people are applying for it. So if somebody is sitting down there and saying, this is what I did in my last year accomplishment, and this is my projection for my long-term goals. You are seeing that they are looking at this person is okay, this person is worth investing in. And that's how you should be positioning yourself. You are positioning yourself as somebody who has the capacity to function regardless of challenges. So you're not just coming to say, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that. 
you can put in your professional accomplishments despite failures, despite the challenges we experienced in this. Now, for example, I'm going to give you an example in terms of um, what we have experienced in Nigeria that will make you even add it to challenges. At some point in Nigeria, we experienced some social um, challenge um, due to the political unrest. We had some um, difficulties in cash flow. As a business person, how did you navigate through cash flow problems in Nigeria th throughout that period? How were you able to deal with that challenge? How were you able to deal with the economical crisis? Today, we are dealing with fuel subsidy, the Naira is, and, the, and the dollar they are playing, um, who will get to a, a particular position first. You, as a business person, they want to see how you are thinking through challenges. So you're not just coming here to say, I have won this award, I have done this, I have done that. You're coming to say, these are the challenges I faced, and this is how I was able to tackle them. These are the things that I have reached. And this is why they are justifying, my accomplishments is justifying my long-term goals. Because with this, we want to be able to increase our revenue to this, 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 by, by put, put a projection, make it look like, if I said, nobody can, you're not doing an interview now, so nobody can see your gestures. Nobody can see whether you are, you know, as I'm presenting right now to you, you can hear my voice, you know how passionate I am, I'm talking about it. But your passion should be inside your inside your written notes. The way you write it, somebody should feel your passion. Now, there's something I said to a, a class last week, and I said to them, I said, don't let someone read your essay and say, oh, this person did very well without taking you to the next level. Let them read your essay and say, wow, this person, let's keep this person. Let's note this person down. Let this person even get to the interview. I mean, let this person, let's even hear, you know, there are some people that never cross the interview stages because they, they are, they are um, application students that they wanted to hear what this person had to say. They just wanted to let it come, come and tell us, how did you do this? How did you get to this point? It's just because your application, what you were writing, showed that you have capacity so don't just come and write and say hey this is what i've done oh, oh, we wish we can take you further but we can't at the moment you know so write like you know what you're here for right like you know what this investor you have to invest in me because if you don't invest in me you are missing out there are a lot of people or there are a lot of things that my business would do when we get this fellowship you have to let them see that you you have so much to give and yet you have done with little resources. You've not been to America before, but with little resources, you're able to do this. Imagine when you now go to America. That's the idea and the scenario, like Gabriel mentioned, that you're creating in your mind. Like, see, I've not gone to America. I've never even been to, at the time when I was writing my application, I'd never even been to any other African country, right? But I was writing it like, you know what? This is what we do in our hub. We already have Kenya, Nigeria. We have Ghana, we have this and that. And we've been able to do this and do this and do this. Imagine when I go for the fellowship and come back, <laughs> I'm going to be a badass. See, it's not even a small level. I'm not going to be a small level girl. You know, that's exactly the scenario you want to be able to create um, as a business. You want, to, you want to position yourself as someone who's a business leader because if they invest that money inside you now, it's returns. They want to come back and say, okay, this person is already doing great things um, in their space. So that's what I wanted to add. Um, for the first essay. I hope that helps any other person. Yeah, it helps a lot, friend. Uh, and I've summarized what uh, three of you said. Um, if you had further explanations, uh, she saves us time because she has any questions about the uh, questions in the essays, <laughs> which is very helpful. Uh, she she talked about um, uh, during challenges. How how are you going to cope? Because we are having an insecurity challenge that is COVID nineteen. Whether it's because of the uh, dollar reasons, the removal of subsidy. How are you be able to cope and still continue doing your business without giving up? Which strategy are you be, uh, be able to develop during that? It's also. Uh, a great thing because they believe if you can be able to survive that, it wouldn't be greater. Imagine. So thank you so much. And um, summarizing all what they said is while writing your essays, you should be able to highlight the impact you've made, 
uh, years of experience if we can um, uh, uh, quantify your achievements my quantify your achievements for example i've been able to do this number of stuff you know with the particular experience you have if you can quantify i've been able to generate number of impact if you can do that it's what to differentiate you uh, between other people that have pieces make sure you're taking note of it and uh, uh, thank you so much uh, I, I, I would love to move someone next question here Okay, he said most the impact of leadership be on just business or about impact of people. I think uh, we've answered that, further answered that because we talk about uh, kind of people you've been able to do this number of uh, stuff, you know. Uh, also, uh, when we talk about number of uh, impact on people in business, it depends on number of people been able to employ, you know, number of to elevate the poverty, something. If your business will be able to let's say have uh, 10 numbers of em uh, employees, please add that because it's really making impact on them. They are, they, they, uh, you know, they're not being uh, doing nothing. They, they, they're doing a lot on their business. It's also an impact to people. And uh, let me see if I can see another question. So, Uh, same sector. He said, if you manage businesses that are not in the same sector, is it okay to talk about the or just six to one? Can you answer that further? Sorry, I didn't get the question. If you manage businesses that are not in the same sector, is it okay to talk about all the businesses or just six to one? Pick the one that um, you already have a strong suit um, in. So let me give you an example. So last year, I had six people who wanted to apply for the fellowship. Two of them actually got in. Five of them got to the interview stage. I'll give you a hint. Now, one of them, she had a food business, but she also had a fashion business. So by the time she was applying and she came to meet me, um, I knew I know how to be a fashion um, entrepreneur so by the time she came to meet me I, I was helping her and nurturing her to apply in the track of business and she was obviously applying with the food business on getting to the interview she didn't have a license to execute the food business which means she didn't have NAFDAQ license um, and some other license that she was asked during the interview but in my mind I thought she was applying you know with fashion um, I taught her all the tips to apply. She got into the um, interview stage, but she did not cross because she, she didn't have the license. So if you know that you have businesses that are in different sectors, use the one you have like a strong suit mm -hmm. in. So let's say if you have traction in one, um, use the one that has traction, use the one that already has, maybe if you have licenses, use the one that already have license, use the one that already gives you um, some level of balance, ground balance, and something that you can easily talk about. Uh, and then one thing I would like to mention, I know we, we haven't talked about it in terms of uh, what we have been talking about so far. There is a point where you would have to submit your CV or you would have to talk about your experience in your application. As much as possible, make sure that whatever experience you're putting in your CV is also in line with how you, what you're applying for. If you're applying it for business, make sure that your CV is in line. You, it's more like you're applying for a job. So if you say you're applying for business in the business track, make sure your CV talks about experiences. If, if you've worked in the business in the business world, if you own a business, um, and then highlight your experience and the things that you've done um, in business. You're feeling yourself. Um, I think someone, someone, someone should open their mic. Thank you. Go ahead. Sir. Okay. So your CV should be able to itemize the things that you have done, your experience as well, in line with the track 
that you are applying for. Um, if you are as a business person, put all your I'm the founder of this, this is what we do, blah, blah, blah. This is what I do as the founder. I run this, I lead this um management, I oversee operations, you know, list it. So it, it shows your your day-to-day -day experience and uh day-to-day -day activities or things that you do in running your business. So don't just go there and say my CV, you drop any house CV or you drop any, uh, make sure your CV is curated properly. Make sure it is highlighted. It has everything documented in it and you have it there, right? So that's for that. So yeah, if you have a business that you that you are running in, in different sectors, you can also highlight your other businesses along the way, but make sure that the main focus um, for why you're applying is on one particular business. Thank you so much uh, for that. So um, uh, now I think we, we, we're done for the essays. Let me just recap for questions. Uh, is there a question? Uh, this one says, uh, please, what, what will you advise? Uh, I think, Freda, I will let you rest. I will send these questions to uh, Elola. Uh, this guy says, uh, what he will advise is that person who runs a, a non-profit and also the social enterprise as a corporate social responsibility. All right. Thank you, Mohamed. Um, I think I'll, I think Freda actually answered much of that um, in what, um, in the answer she recently gave, which is that you need to um, go with the one that is actually um, your strongest, your strongest, strongest foot, right? Now, what I mean by um, strongest foot is, on the normal level, you are allowed to use any of them. You can use a social enterprise to get in, depending on the social. If it's a social enterprise and it's not for profit, it may fall under um, the civic track. Right, but if it is for profit, it will definitely fall under the business track, right? So you want to look at all the questions that you've been asked and um, really determine which of the uh, of the organizations that you are running are uh, fits into or you are able to set a story on based on the essays that you actually have on ground, right? And you need to also be able to connect your future. Remember that this is very important. You cannot just tell a story that, has, that does not have foundation. I think the other speakers also uh, made mention of that. Your story has to have a foundation, right, uh, in your past. And then it also has to have a projection into your future. For the people who are um, assessing the, uh, the, the, the applications to see that it is connected, right? So make sure that you're doing that. What I would completely advise you against is running both. Do not be tempted to run both. Start from the beginning. Know for a very certainty that this particular business is the one I want to apply uh, uh, the fellowship for. And go with that, right? Let there not be confusion. Don't do that food business and then get to the uh, interviews and begin to mention fashion. That would be a total put off. Then when you look at the words in itself, the truth of the matter is, when I did my own application, I had to be making compromises because the 150 words, when someone tells you to summarize certain things, how you dealt with conflict, how you, your professional achievement with 250 words, and I know a lot of things that have happened in my life, in the life of my business, if I'm to write about it, I could write a book, right? So to even get my thought process to fit into 250 words was challenging enough than to now actually now accumulate um, two businesses in one. So when we're doing, um, um, uh, when we're applying, I had Medibird, which was um, at that time, we've now pivoted to uh, laboratory technology, but at, at that time with a telemedical company, we were operating across 29 states in Nigeria. And I also had a mental health startup on the site. Now, I did not mention the mental health startup. I just focused on the telemedicine part of it, right? I focused on the telemedicine part of it 
and I stuck with the telemedicine part of it. When I went to the interview, I made sure that I stuck to my telemedicine, right? My entire CV was showing a connection to uh, my to the tele, to the telemedicine. On the other hand, the Q mind, they could start asking me some questions that I, I may not be able to answer. Do you, do you understand? Because I started up the mental health um, platform or the mental health company as an as someone who was passionate about solving mental health, right? But um, if you're asked, if I'm asked for social proof at that time, I may not actually have it. So I made sure I did something that I had social proof for, uh, which was the uh, the telemedicine. Um, I've been involved in tech companies before. I've worked in prop tech. I've worked in hardware technology across three continents. So by the time I was applying for um, uh, the part of telemedicine, to the reader or the person who assesses my CV, is able to see a connection between my past and my current activities. And I it could believe that what I was projecting into the future was realistic, right? So my story of mental health, as I'm saying it right now, began in the fellowship. You know, when we began to really do a lot of dealings on our projects, our work, that was when I began to really express my um, my vision for mental health. And then the professors over there helped me to formulate the principles, the policies that I would need to do. So don't worry about your second business. So you can still get to your institute in the U.S. and have your mentors work with you based on the two businesses. Or you can even abandon the business and actually start another one during the mentorship. Once you get into the MWF, you have gotten into it already. So if you get to the U.S. and change change your business entirely, no problem. We had a guy from Zimbabwe, just to close off, we had a guy from Zimbabwe um, who came into the fellowship with a business, um, a, a fitness business. By the time we leave the fellowship, they had abandoned much of what he was doing. The entire model has been abandoned, right? Because when they worked on him, when they did a lot of work on him, he was able to see the fallacy in some of his models and he was able to change, you know, and pivot to something that was actually better. So, yeah, that answers it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Gabriel, I don't know if you can highlight about the uh, last aspect of uh, uh, adding CV uh, because I think um, there might be maybe some spices that people can add to that CV which can differentiate them with people. Then go ahead. All right. Um, thanks. Um, so just to add, right, I think um, my co-speakers have actually said a lot, right? So just to give an example, I'm into tech and I'm into the agriculture, right? But when it comes to agriculture, I don't have, let me say, to the extent at which I have the knowledge to be, to be able to pitch myself, right? So I didn't, I, I never went for agriculture at all. I just went straight to tech entirely, right? And now when I'm applying for tech, I'm actually trying to tailor my CV to that tech um, region in terms of my leadership skills, in terms of how much of impact I've actually created, right? And the, the reality is this, when you are talking about leadership instinct, it could go in it, it could go into people's life, it could go into the business, right? So you must be able to just be try as much as well to just articulate yourself and align whatever you are trying to push for, your future thing that you're trying to look into and align your CV to you. Because at the end of the day, there's a reason why they're asking you to submit the CV. That's just the truth. There's actually a reason why they ask you to submit your CV. Because if they want, if they don't want the CV, they will just ask you to just probably submit the essays. But they wanted to see a fact that you guys are your your vision, your mission that you're actually into right now is aligning and everything is still connecting to each other as much as possible. So try as much as possible to concise your CV in terms of the um, success that you've able to do. What are the things that you have done as a leader in the business you are trying to do? Just like Prada have said, like we've actually gone through a lot of experiences in Nigeria. And the reality is that it takes someone that is resilient to actually have a business in Nigeria now and an entrepreneur to still run a business in Nigeria as of this stage, right? We've run through that, that. And the reality is that sometimes as a leader, we don't know that we've actually bring in some strategy to help the business. Most of the time, we can't really put it in words. But really, if you can actually survive in the experiences we've actually gone through in Nigeria, it shows the fact that you have one way or the other, a model that you are running that is working, Maybe you've not been able to visualize it, 
this is the moment for you to now sit yourself down and, and try to just articulate those things together and say, okay, this is what I'm doing that is right. And this is what I've been able to do through this trial period and still sustain the business as much as possible. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I would love to add um, something also for the filmmakers. I've seen like, a few questions here. If you are from the filmmaking industry, like from the UTI team, uh, I think the half of them were into filmmaking. Uh, you can uh, add pictures of what you've taken uh, in your CV. You can, you can find your video and share the sample of your work in the CV. And uh, someone also asked about um, the Diali certificates. You can you can add them. It's, it's a great thing actually. And then uh, for people that are into tech as well, if you have number of uh, certificates you've obtained online, please add them. Add as much certificate as you could. Uh, if you have uh, doing a lot of businesses like I've seen. Uh, um, the Filola have answered that, uh, Freda have also answered that, but to highlight again is you can focus on one business and then on your CV, you can you can add more of what you do. If, if, if you, instead of adding that, which uh, you know, it's not uh, necessary, but if you insist on adding that, then please add it in your CV. That also helps your application. Uh, let me recap, add a lot of pictures if you have in your CV. Add a lot of certificates if you have in, uh, in your CV. And then if you also want to talk about some accomplishment you've made, you can go ahead and do that. Like I myself, I took about um, two businesses, but I focused on one on my essay. I didn't mix in my CV. I talked about my other business part of my accomplishment. You can go ahead and do it. And uh, they are also asking for your... Um, uh, IG, IG handles or stuff, if you feel free to share, you can share with them if you can take them on one on one mentorship. I don't know if I'm violating the rules, but I'm sorry for that. Uh, so now, heading about uh, link, there are places where it says you can add link and give this question for you. And I know that uh, a lot of us maybe haven't written articles. So, what do you advise people on that? So if, if, if you're going to add links, right? Um, so let, let me talk it from this aspect, right? As much as possible, you want to support your application with so much evidence you have. Now, okay, so I, I'll probably say it from my own angle. Into tech, I've been so many softwares that are online and stuff like that. So the reality of thing I tried doing was to impute all the links for these softwares that are actually in the market, right? Include them into the application, right? So. I, in my CV, I have like a link I created somehow on my CV for the product I've actually worked on and I'm doing work in the market, so to say, that you can actually see it through. So even on the application, if you have the, the option to actually add evidence to it in terms of links, you can always add it. It's, it's something to even help your application as a whole. So have your links, have your pictures, have anything you can actually just help to support your um, application. That will go a long way actually in helping you with the application. Basically, yeah, and uh, also adding to that, if you even uh, publish some articles that engage on, uh, uh, engage positively, even on your social media, not necessarily it has to be uh, on a particular publication. We can add to that if you think it's important. Like I always repeat, and all of them repeat: don't exaggerate, don't put too much of information that are not necessary. But if you think they are necessary. Can copy them even if it's Facebook uh, article written, you can add to them. Um, pertaining um, awards, uh, uh, if Lola, I don't, I don't know if you can answer this. Pertaining awards and honor, so uh, what do you advise people on? So you have to give them the relief of if they don't have it, what, what they should do if they have it, what they should do. Just go ahead. All right, thank you, Mamre. Um, I think the Battle of Award is a very, very important publication, and you should absolutely not underestimate it. Why? Because, let me give an example. A lot of people have finished um, MWF right now, and have literally gone into other fellowships. A lot of people have actually finished MWF and into Shedney. 
a lot of people have finished MWF. I've gotten the um there's this program in the UK. I, I'm forgetting the name now. Uh one young world. Yes, one young world. Many opportunities simply open because you got access into a previous opportunity, right? And so when you don't have uh, of your you're denying the reader the opportunity to see what you have actually done, the social proof that you had. Let me give you an example of my own story. When we did the application for MWF 2022, in 2020, I had the opportunity to be visited by the, uh, I, I was invited by the uh, Federal Ministry of Health, the Department of Hospital Services, to contribute to the National Case Management for COVID-19. So they saw what we were doing. They were like, oh, my goodness, this guy, we like what you're doing uh, in the case of the uh, heads, of, uh, heads of hospitals in Luz, Lassoot, all University of George teaching hospital and all of that. And I was the youngest person in that particular uh, um, event. Right? Now, there was a uh, in the COVID-19 case management. But what I did was when I was writing my application for MWF in 2022, I cited it. I cited that I was invited by the Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria um, to continue COVID-19 case management. I cited that. Then when I wanted to cite another one, I, I, I did something. In 2020, I did a competition, right, for Innovo. Innovo is a program that was funded by the United Kingdom in Nigeria Tech Hub, right? So they did a lot of, they had about 624 companies that applied. My company also applied for, um, to be selected as part of the, um, um, the accelerator program that will happen in South Africa. Now, I wasn't part of the top 10, but I was part of the top 100. I made sure I was part of the top 100. We didn't get any reward or whatsoever. I made I cited it as applying for MWF, right? Because like we said before, you are a person who is doing a particular, or who is, do, who is in a particular industry, but you have a story. You cannot just write an application and from nowhere and expect that people will believe what you have done. So whatever lead to validations you've had, I don't even use the word award because many people don't actually have awards, but whatever lead to val validations that you've had, you slip it in into your story, right? Um, so that you can it can convey that social proof, right? So I'll definitely advise you. Any uh, uh, I will just say on the side note that ensure that your award that you're citing or you're uploading is an relevant. I think that's also very important. Um, if it's relevant to your professional uh, achievements. If it's re relevant to your entrepreneurial background, you can put it forward. But if it is not relevant to those two things, probably you should consider before putting it out there, right? And you may get a third-party advice from somebody around and just say, okay, do you think this? And that person will be able to really figure out uh, uh, to put, it, put it on or actually not cite that. So, yeah, that's my advice on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bruno. Uh, so now going back to uh, Freda, I'm going to round up. If you have uh, any question, please drop it in the uh, uh, chat box or the comment box so now we can answer them. Uh, but in the other part of my talk, Freda, if you are to give them one advice, just one advice that's going to help them with this AC, what will it be? Um, Mohammed, can you repeat the question again? If you give them one advice, one takeaway you know, that will help them is this application, what will it be? Um, one advice would be um, don't write like you're a newbie. So even if you're a newbie, I think there's this tendency that we always um, do, we shy away from um, the fact that 
we can position ourselves as leaders, even though you do not have any track record or experience, don't get intimidated by what the questions are. Because a lot of times, many things that stopped people from applying or many things that hindered a lot of people from putting in their best foot into their applications was because they were intimidated by the questions instead of you know, putting in and positioning themselves as a leader, right? So the application already says they're looking for leaders and you in your in your capacity, in your whatever place that you're working or wherever you find yourself is you're already important. The thing is, a lot of people think you're not valuable now. You think, oh, when I win an award or when everybody knows me on Instagram or when I have 10,000 followers or when a lot of people can call my names in different places. That's when I'm, that's when I'm valuable, when I'm important. As long as you're in a place and you're contributing to the growth of the place and you're contributing to impacting lives of people and people are benefiting from the value that you bring, you are definitely a leader. You're definitely valuable. So when you're writing your application, write that with the mindset of I am valuable. I deserve this spot. I deserve to be here. And that's, also helps you in building your mentality, in building a mindset that, you know what, regardless of the outcome of this, I am writing because I know I'm positive about it. So because when you're already writing like, oh, will I get it or will I not get it? Is this a good thing for me or is this not a good thing for me? You know, you're already positioning yourself like, okay, maybe failure. Um, so you will not be writing your application with confidence. Your application should, should portray that this person knows what they are doing. This person knows their onion. This person is a champion this person is a leader this person is who we want that's how you should write in your, your story your story like i mentioned before should not be a sympathetic story it should be a story that captivates someone to take you to the next level don't write a story because um you want everybody to sympathize with you or you want everybody to feel sorry for you right that you are solving a problem like i know the problem nigeria is facing right now and if I go and come back, I have bigger problem solutions to the problem, right? So that's the advice I'll give you as you're preparing um, to apply for the fellowship. Don't um, delay your applications um, because at the time when, don't be like me, I submitted five minutes to the, time, <laughs> to the time. I always say that. Don't be like me. I submitted five minutes to the time. In fact, I was submitting my application and I, the moment I was getting application successful was when a few minutes I just saw that oh it has closed and you know um, I could no longer apply I'm like oh my god if I had missed out or sat down one more minute you know so don't be like me don't withhold yourself from the opportunities you can assess and who you can become um, by delaying your applications and I wish everyone a good luck uh, massive success as you apply thank you so much thank you so much um uh, that's a great one. Um, if, you know that, if you were to advise people with one thing that will help them uh, make the application fruitful, what will they do? All right. Yes, yeah, thank you, uh, Mohammed. I would say that um, believe in yourself, right? Believe in yourself. And I want to use this small example. You know, last year I was helping a few people to review. Uh, their MWF application, and the person was like saying that um, the person was asking, he's into Zobo production, and he was asking me if that was a good project enough. Uh, uh, that was a good project enough to um, to ad uh, to advocate for in the um, MWF, right? And I told the person that you absolutely can. It depends on how you tell your story. Because you're saying Zobo doesn't make your application any less valuable, right? The most important thing is that you need to be able to scrap out the important value proposition. So let's say, for instance, just a, a an example. I am selling Zobo in Agigi, and let's say, for example, I am selling it at 100 Naira, right? And a bottle of Coca-Cola is 250 Naira. If you spin that story enough, you could actually say, you are um, you are providing, or if you tell your story enough, not spin it because you're not lying. If you tell your story well enough, you can tell the readers that you are selling 
um, Zobu to the, the, the part of the Nigerian population who may not be able to afford times three that amount to buy Coca-Cola. Or fact, and from the reader's perspective, they're like, oh, wow, you know, this is affordability. And that affordability goes into um, a major feeder for inclusion. So they see what you're doing as an opportunity to include other people, you know, to include the less privileged in society to drink Zobu, right? While uh, the richer part of the society can afford Coca-Cola, right? So for anything that you're doing, we had somebody who said during our, um, during, when we were in, uh, in the US, we had someone from Ninji, Ninji Republic, who said she was showing, um, she, was, she was showing, she was doing fashion to help um, help the society or help the young people to avoid joining, joining Boko Haram. Right when she said that, <laughs> you know, she was able to sell the story in Niger when they had the uh, when they had the interviews. But when we got to the US, of course, because you're now dealing with mega professors in uh, in, in in business, like Professor John Dogget was like hammering on her. What do you mean? What do you mean? You know? And he was really, you know, hammering on her that how can you be selling clothes or doing fashion, you know, to help people abandon Boko Haram? How does that even make sense, right? But somehow that story went through, you know, how the, uh, the people that did the interview back in NJ, right? The business professors over there will help you to redesign everything and all, but don't underestimate what you are currently doing, right? Don't underestimate it. Go there, tell it with confidence, tell them your value proposition, right? They, will, they may want to question you and they may want to, sometimes some people may even want to use pressure taxes, like, okay, are you sure you know what you're saying? A lot of that. Insist on what you are doing, as long as you're not lying, right? Insist on your value proposition. Stick on it and say, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> the whole case scenario, they would not be that you apply again. We had people that apply seven times and eventually still got it. So don't be afraid. Don't underestimate what you're doing. I believe in you and I know that there are people from this particular court that will actually be making it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have just um, maybe two minutes to round up, but um, I will ask the admins if they will allow us to take uh, a few two people raising their hands. I don't know if that is sufficient for them. But before then, I uh, also from uh, the Ali Network Lagos and uh, IG account. I will also drop my IG account. If you want, you can follow for questions and follow up. And uh, going ahead, Gabriel, if you have to advise them with one thing that will help them with their um, uh, fellowship application, what will it be? Okay, um, okay so uh, I'm just going to give this in a scenario, right? Someone that sells bitterly, right? That sells it for 15 era, and someone that re re repackage the bitterly into a capsule that sells it for 2000 era. It shows a difference in the mindset and it shows a difference in who is actually in charge of their story. So my advice is going to be be in charge of your story, right? Be in control of your story. You are the best person that can sell yourself. And as much as possible, when you're applying, I always advise keep the positive mindset, right? It's life itself. It's all about trying to just eat your target, right? So give all, give all your best to it, right? Give all your best. It's just going to be one time this year. And I feel the fact that if you, are, if you are going to probably dedicate a couple of hours, days, weeks on it, it's worth it, right? So be, be in charge of the story. Keep the a positive answer. And the most important thing is just your story. That's just the truth. So as much as possible, say it how much it's, how the vision you have yourself is bothering you and let it be heard. Let your story be heard. It's just a platform that your story needs to be heard. And the fact that you are here shows the fact that you are daring enough to actually want to take that bold step ahead and go for it. We are all supporting and we are rooting for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I I have uh, two people uh, raising their hands. It's time already, but I'll give you one minute. Please don't exceed. Hello, good evening. Hi, talk, talk. Yeah. Hello, can you hear talk, me? Talk, yeah, talk. Okay, 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 yeah. So I'm sorry I joined in late. 
And I just wanted to ask for a few tips about the long EC session because I believe they might talk about it, but I missed out. Yeah. Um, what we're talking about is you should try to uh, write your years of experience and also quantify your achievements. Also, uh, state what uh, has motivated you to take the work you are doing so that they will know that you are enjoying it out of passion because you just want to you know do it for a time being and then uh, live it. And then also talk about your uh, long-term goal. What is it that you, you, you want to achieve that's going to get impact in the community you are into? This is what they've talked about. And also for the also short essays, uh, Freda talked about not only accomplishment, not only major uh, goals and stuff. You have to also talk about how you've been able to uh, be successful during uh, hardship. You know, like uh, for, uh, when there's insecurity, when there is increase in that in certain days, how are you able to cope and continue what you are doing? They want to see that resilient in you. And also for the, the part it talked about ethnicity and stuff. Uh, if you are working in a company, uh, when problems arise, how are you able to solve it? You as a leader, without discriminating at all, uh, any based on their religion, because this is Muslim, this is Christian, this is white, this is black, this is uh, boy, this is all. How are you able to uh, bring a synergy among them without discriminating them? That's what they want to see. Because when you you start to select them, they're going to mix you with a lot of people, different races, backgrounds, and countries. They want to make sure that they are in peace without any uh, hardship and problem. If you have any question, you can uh, send a message to Yali Lagos on the Instagram. I'm really sure they will link you with the right person to answer your question, or they will also they, they will answer your question directly. Ali, know if you are hearing me, unmute your mic and talk. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Talk. Talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Doc. Mm -hmm. See, my question has to do with... Uh, first, mm -hmm. I have registered for Yanni since 2017, but I've not been following the activity, uh, especially this year that I now go to the... Uh, the summit, the fiscal summit that I had in Abuja. Mm -hmm. So one, uh, how do I become an active member? Secondly, uh, uh, what you do? Okay, continue. Uh, secondly, um, this issue of this um, fellowship is it going to be? Is there any age range for the application? Yes, you are asked to question how are you going to become a member. If you want to become a member, you can chat Yali Network Lagos on Instagram, and we will assist you with that. And for the age group, there is age limitation between 25 and 35. Uh, if you pass that year, you are not eligible to apply. But if before the application closes, you are still at the age of 35, that means uh, it's after September 13 that you're going to be 37. You can still apply, okay? Okay. So, uh, now I will leave that to the uh, host for him to come, sorry for her to come and end the program. Thank you so much, our uh, facilitators, for your time. You're very good. All right, thank you so, so much. Um, good evening, everyone, again. Thank you so much for joining. Very special appreciation to our facilitators. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Frida. Thank you, Ife. I mean, that was just very powerful. Thank you so much. And I know our participants have definitely gleaned one or two things. Now, I know uh, our dear moderator, thank you so much for an excellent job and for taking time to answer all the questions in the chat box and the Q&A section. But please, this is a Yali Network Nigeria program, not just Yali Network Lagos. It's being organized by Yali right. Network Nigeria. And if, you, and if you check the chat box, I have dropped uh, various social media links for you to follow. It would be best for you to follow so that you can stay updated to all our activities. While we have state hubs, of course, we have um, Yali Network state hubs in all states of Nigeria currently. 
And uh, But we do have national events, just like the national summits, which someone just referenced, are held in Abuja. So please follow the social media pages to um, stay updated to our national events. Then someone has, I know I've seen a couple of questions about membership. There's also the email in what I just dropped. You can send an email to Yali Network Nige, that's N-I-G, at gmail.com, and you will be linked to your um, state hall. Please, that's the general, that's our official Yali Network Nigeria email. So if you need any information that concerns Yali Network in Nigeria, any information as to um, what state hub to join, please you reach out to us and we'll definitely give you all the information that you require. So thank you all again for joining. Tomorrow's session is at the same time, 7 p.m. And tomorrow's session, we focus specifically on civic engagement. That's for those of you who are in the development sector, who are probably carrying out community impact projects. That's your sector tomorrow. However, I would also advise that you still join even if you are maybe on the business track i would advise that you join because just like today if you notice uh facilitators didn't just just zero in on only business they shared very useful tips that you can use um for other tracks so thank you all um all again for joining thank you gabriel thank you frida thank you ife for really spending time with us tonight. We really appreciate you. And to our dear moderator, <laughs> thank you so much. And by the way, he's the coordinator of Yali Network Zamfara. So <laughs> if you're in Zamfara, that's your coordinator right there. So so everyone, thank you all and um, have a good evening and we'll see you tomorrow, same time. Goodbye. Uh, how do they access the recordings? Those that registered, we may send, keyword may, but I think those that registered, we have their email addresses and um, if need be, and we have to send, we'll send it to those that registered. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. All right, good evening. Good night, everyone.